<laughs> and people disagree with me on this. After I, you know, I take a lot of that to read. I challenge anybody who's read the Bible to read Matthew 6 and 7, John 5, 8, and you will immediately know where the book finds its origin. So, so there's that. It's no detriment, I think, to the Christian message. In fact, I think it provides a framework to receive the Christian message. Um, so that's what I have to say. I mean, I mean, I literally have seen hundreds of guys who will stand up there and tell you God has changed them in a way that medicine couldn't, that an eating, eating couldn't, in a way that psychiatry couldn't. The list is, goes on and on and on. So, I want you to tell me, how old were you when you began your addiction? I was 15. 15 years old? Yeah, on all dates, yes. It just gives you some indication of the issue that we're dealing with. This is, this really is an epidemic in America, but praise the Lord, just set you free. Let's take a moment. Something that I just learned this week. And then this morning, 
your music team, your worship team, got up and sang it. Mm -hmm. The very first song that you sang, I shared on Friday night, and it is this. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. The Hebrew word for in the beginning is barashit. But the Hebrew language is pictographic letters. And if you take those pictographs one by one of the word barashit, what it says is the Son of God was crushed, his hand upon a cross. His hand upon a cross. And Revelation tells us what? The Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So I want to try to encapsulate 39 years of some of the most intense research of any artifact that's ever been studied on planet Earth. And yet I know there are people that insist it's a forgery. This much I know. Whatever the shroud is, it's not a forgery. Amen. Whatever it is, it's not a forgery. It's a burial cloth of a Jewish man, anthropologically speaking, 30 to 35 years of age, who was crucified, crowned with thorns, scourged, whose side was pierced with a Roman lance, whose body was put into a tomb in this linen cloth in the manner of the Jews to bury their dead. And believe me, that's a whole issue with some denominational teaching. They think Jesus was wrapped by the mummy? Not so. Get the book called the Code of Law, the Jewish Book of Mourning, you'll find out this is what it looks like. And I've had the privilege of not only studying it firsthand, touching it, being there, we were there, longer than anyone in recorded history has been in the presence of the shroud. Now that may not mean anything to you until I start showing you the pictures, but let me tell you this. Probably about 20 years ago, I was speaking at a little church, much smaller than this year, probably about a church over in this corner. It was down in Brooklyn, New York. And I was giving the presentation nowhere near as devout as it is now. How many of you ever known one of those little grandmothers who's been in the church since she was knee high to a pub and prays and worships God and prophesied to everybody, come, son, you're going to serve the Lord. You know the kind of thing you're speaking about. <laughs> Ministry, this lady comes up to me and she took my hands and she said, This man's hands have touched the blood of Jesus, and there will be healing in his hands. Oh, hallelujah! I, I've never recovered from that. From that day to this, I will say this God is still a healing, miracle working God, and we have seen many miracles of healing just by the pictures you're about to see. White linen in the blood of spring, hidden purpose of the shroud. The shroud is a burial cloth, 13 and a half feet long, 3 and a half feet wide. <coughs> the image on the shroud is a faint sepia colored image right down the center of the cloth of a man, head to head, there's front, there's back. These things here, ignore them. They're actually fire damage that occurred in 1532. The lines are scorches that follow the folding pattern and the triangular sort of shaped things are patches that were sewn in. Uh, if I forget to tell you, remind me, those are one of the secrets to why we know the shroud is a lot older than the forgery theory say that it is. The interesting thing about the shroud is when you take a picture, what is rather faintly seen becomes clearly the image of a man's body laid out in death. The reason for that is the shroud as it exists is a perfect photographic negative. When the very first photographs were taken, the photographer Secunda Pia realized as that image developed on the glass plate that he had soaked in that silver solution that he was looking at the face of Jesus. History records he almost dropped the glass onto the ground. He never expected it to be a photograph. He merely wanted to record for those who never see the shroud what it looked like. Okay. So I said it's buried as the men of the Jews to bury their dead, John 1940. If you look at the body here, there's one thing that I have to point out that's not accurate. The loincloth, it didn't exist. Christ was stripped before they hung him on that cross. And consistent with Jewish burial custom, his body was put into that shroud naked as the day he was born. But let me tell you why that's critical. 
No artist, until some of these modern, weird, perverted folks, has ever dared to try to paint Christ in the nude. And the, the sense of modesty had been so built in that even this artist, who clearly was looking at the shroud, put a loincloth on for decency. This is not an artwork. Next. Okay, here's what it looks like. Like I said, a sepia. This is the positive, the way it would look to the naked eye, except um, it's a black and white, so you can't see the sepia color. And you can see the face, the wound in the side, the hands. There's the fire damage I was telling you about. When you take a photograph, you get the next picture. Now you can clearly see a man's body laid out in death. Face, pectoral muscles of the chest, swelling of the abdomen, which I'll explain in a minute. Wound in the uh, hands, blood on the arms, blood on the face. One knee slightly raised because the body is still slightly in rigor mortis. And you can see that it's clearly the image of a man's body. Here's the thing, crucifixion is a slow form of death by suffocation. Your arms are pulled up just about out of their sockets. We calculate about a 60 degree angle. In order to breathe, you have to pull on the nails in your hands and push on the nails in your feet so you can lean forward and open the lungs. Otherwise, you can't exhale properly. You're suffocated in a matter of minutes. The reason they break the two thieves' legs is to induce suffocation. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead, so they put a spear in his side. Keep in mind, Jesus died on the cross before the two thieves. Why? Because it wasn't normal to scourge someone that you were going to crucify. Many men died under the scourge. It was called the horrible scourge. You'll see that in a second. Okay, here's the dorsal image, same way, next slide. And the dorsal, you can see the crown of thorns, much more like a cap an eastern crown than our wreath, the western crown. You can also see a pigtail of hair. People say, well, that can't be Jesus. Jesus didn't wear long hair. Uh, please tell me where the barbershops were in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Um, anyway, the wounds here on the back, very heavy abrasions, and multiple puncture wounds from the scourge, blood in the feet, and blood and serous fluid, water, if you will, uh, coming from the wound in the side. Notice this little round thing. I don't know if I took it out or not in the interest of time, but that's a water stain, and if it's slightly still there later, you'll understand. Next. Okay. Scripture. David, the sweet songs of Israel, records an exact description of crucifixion 600 years before the Persians invented it as a death. 600 years. There's no other book ever written in history that's been proven prophetically accurate other than the Bible, other than the Word of God. Amen. And for this now to be a forgery, the forger had to match something written 600 years before crucifixion and match it medically speaking. I don't think so. Wound in the feet. We saw the wound in the hands. Next slide. Possible place for the nails here in the feet, and also there could be one through the ankle. Some researchers suggest there's two nails, and the nails in the wrist rather than in the palm of the hands. Again, traditional artistry, they all show the nails in the palms of the hands. What I've described to you with the scourging and the bloody fluid in the lungs, if you started doing that pulling, you're going to tear right through the nails in your hands. But if you're nailed through the wrist, You'll be secured to the cross. The thing about that is, the only crucifixion victims that have been, ever been dug up in the Middle East from the time of Christ, they see scrapings between the two bones of the wrist, the radius and the arm. And they see a nail right down here above the heel. Okay, there's the bruises from carrying a very heavy roughing object. We estimate that the cross beam would have weighed, you know, maybe as much as 200 pounds. It's about the size and shape of a railroad tie. They didn't carry the whole cross like you see in, in movies. The upright remained in place at Calvary, and they just carried the cross beam. Jesus, they would be tied together with a rope, and the scripture tells that Jesus fell. You know why he fell? Not just because he was weak, but because the soldiers would fun, would grab the rope. And with this cross beam, he would fall with no ability to break his fall. 
There's a scourge, known as the horrible scourge, ends weighted with either bits of lead or bone and uh, shaped like barbells, exactly the mark that we see. And remember, Pilate wanted to scourge Jesus so that the Sanhedrin council would relent and let him go. That was Pilate's intent. But when they brought Jesus out, even though he had been scourged unmercifully, Roman soldiers didn't have a limit. What did they say? Crucify. Yeah. Give us a grass. Crown of thorns, very heavy bleeding. Singular in all of history, I don't know any other case that specifically spells out historically that a victim was crowned with thorns other than Jesus Christ. Right, right. Okay, Isaiah 50, I gave my back to the smiters, you saw that. My cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. He was punched. The right eye here is nearly closed from a bruise. There are gaps in his beard here and here. Um, we believe that when the high priest accused him of blasphemy, one of the things traditionally they would do is jerk a, punch of, a piece of his beard out. God's grabbing your hair. Feel how that feels. It's not fun. But it's scripturally accurate. Isaiah 52. As many were astonished at me, his visage, his face, was marred more than any man, and his form were the sons of men. People who have seen the black and white image say it's too regal. It doesn't show the marring, the damage that the scripture says. This is something we call the blood image. It was created using space technology. We digitize the image to show wherever there is blood on the face. I submit to you that I've never seen a man more bloodied. Okay. On the side we've already talked about. Blood and water do not separate in the body until after death. You can see here that this wound went through the side here, the heavier blood and the lighter water or serous fluid as it's called. Um, and also look here and I'll show you on the back a little better. There's a little serous watery runny stuff there. We believe they lifted the Lord onto the shroud and as they did, blood and water continued to drain from that wound. But because blood and serous do not separate the Roman soldiers who were trained to inflict the coup de grace just came to ensure he was dead. He was already dead. Fifth and sixth rib, size and shape, match the Roman mancia. Spear would go into the pericardial area, pierce the heart. Out came blood and water. That's what John's Gospel says. Here's the watery, bloody, serious fluid here on the back. Next. Art. Art suggests that from the 5th century and the latest, from the 5th century onward, images of Christ match this. We believe they were created by artists looking at or familiar with the shroud image. Why? Well, there are a number of things. Some strands of hair here, a crease in the neck, box in the center of the forehead with kind of a little triangle below it, uh, unevenness of the beard, more heavy on this cheek than that. Remember, left, left and right reverse and light and dark reverse when you photograph it. So this would correspond to the bruised area under the right eye. But science is a little more meticulous than that. So let's look at what happens. This is the Christ Pentocrator. It's found throughout uh, Turkey, especially in, in Istanbul or kind of formerly Constantinople, in the um, chapels and things there. It's a well-known image. We believe it came from the shroud. You can see the crease in the neck. Oh, I take it back. That's all right. The crease in the neck that sort of follows the gown, but it's still there. This little unusual shape here in the middle of the forehead. Why would an otherwise competent artist do that? So we put magnets on it so that we can do an overlay. And the next picture will show the shroud with the magnets, so we're positioning it correctly. And the next picture will show the overlay. We believe the artist who painted the Christ Van Tocqueter knew the shroud was looking at the shroud. Wow. Doesn't stop there. It goes further. Here's the pentacular coin about the size of a nickel. We use the same overlay technique. Next. Magnets. Next. The artist who invented that coin knew the shroud. Oh my goodness. Question in my mind. So let's kind of encapsulate where we are. We have a linen garment woven in the Middle East because they didn't have linen in Europe. It came through the southern steppes of Turkey 
because we are also going to see poems in a few minutes, but also we have these images from that area. And this wonderful artist who never reproduced it again, and we can't reproduce it with all of our modern technology, created an image that included this amount of detail? I don't think so. Next. Pollen samples found by the late Dr. Max Fry got a lot of controversy, but his technique was better than our modern technique. We paid $7,000 a roll for a special non-stressing form of cake to lift fragments from the shroud. Dr. Max Fry was a criminal uh, botanist and, and, and microbiologist for this, um, Interpol, took regular tape and went, <laughs> He got, he got pollen, we did. <laughs> but it's pollen that comes from Jerusalem, pollen that comes from Turkey. In other words, the pollen trace matches the history that we didn't know until 1978. The pollen is on there 600 years before the invention of the microscope and the discovery of pollen. And, and the pollen matches the artistic trace that I just gave you. Pretty smart forger, wouldn't you say? Next. This is what got our foot in the door in Italy and led to our team being selected to do the research. It's a three-dimensional image of the face. Notice the box on the forehead. Notice the bridge of the nose, the lips and the mustache, the beard, the gap here. Notice the cheekbone. Everything that matches the image perfectly three-dimensional. Now, just like Secunda Pia, we did not expect the image to be three-dimensional. Secunda Pia didn't expect it to be what happened was we got a spin-off of space technology called a VPA image analyzer. Um, plain English, when they sent the astronauts to the moon, they wanted to map out the surface of the moon so it wouldn't hit a crater and kill the astronauts, American taxpayers take a good view of that. And so they know that the moon reflects the light of the sun, they developed this equipment to measure the distance that was reflected by the light from the moon's surface. The shroud, we knew, seems to have some kind of correlation between the brightness of the image as viewed on the shroud and what we see. So we put the image under there and we get a three-dimensional. We were blown away. Nobody expected that. We can't, if I took a wonderful Android... Oh, yep. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I took this wonderful Android phone and took everybody's picture and put it under the VPA an uh, analyzer, your own mother wouldn't recognize you because the camera cannot encode automatically distance information. The shroud does, and it does it perfect to a body feel. Next. So here's the body, front, pectoral muscle to the chest, swelling of the abdomen, one of the signs of death by suffocation. The Bruises on the back, all the way down to some roundedness in the area of the calves and thighs. There's our big tail of hair. The shroud is perfectly three-dimensional front and rear. We only know that it exists. We cannot duplicate it, nor can we give you a proper explanation for why. The late um, Dr. Ray Rogers, dear friend of mine, lovely brother in the board, who had spent all of his lifetime developing, as he told me, Ken, weapons of mass destruction. God put me on this project. I want to do something good with my life. And before he passed away, he had come up with a phrase that he called flash photolysis. And he basically implied that every pore of the Lord's body suddenly fired a miniature laser beam for a split second of time. He called a lot of flack for that. Sadly, he kind of backed off of it. I don't think it's that far out of the realm of possibility, but what I will say is that none of us knows for sure what exactly happened. We found coins, fragments of pottery on the eyes, something like that, and we wanted to know what they were. It is in keeping with Jewish burial custom. Here's the lepton of Pontius Pilate. This was very badly eroded, but notice the edge of the coin as it was struck all cut on this end and rounded here. These are the letters that are eroded here. U C A I, part of the scription, uh, inscription, Tiberius Caesarus. Here is the shepherd's staff, 
the size and shape were exact, 11 millimeters, about the size of a dime. Um, U, C, A, I, the shepherd's staff, the edge of the coin. Can everyone see that? Yep. No doubt, right? Now let's see the 3D. U, C, A, I, shepherd's staff, edge of the coin. So if this thing is a fake, somehow the guy got a lepton of Pontius Pilate that was in circulation from 30 to 33 AD that was a legitimate coin for a Jewish burial because it did have the image of Caesar on it, and he put it on the eye and got that in the picture. Next. Obviously, I'm being just a little bit facetious, but okay. Here we go. This is us with the uh, platform. Somewhere back here, that might be me. There's a little afro here in back there somewhere. <laughs> this platform that we built, pure stainless steel with polymer coated magnets, and it was used to hold the, the shroud without damaging it. We didn't want to damage it in any way. And the gold panels you see are actually gold mylar, like you saw on the astronauts. That's what we put on it. We didn't want to contaminate the shroud in any way. And then the Italian authorities marched it into a stump tech down to a plywood board. Oh. Oh. Uh. oh, are you kidding? Next. Okay, we backlit the shroud. Why? Because there is no image. It is superficial. There's no pigment, no powder, no dye, nothing artificial. So when you see somebody on Discovery that says, oh, I got a statue, and I dusted it, and I put it on a cloth, and I came away with the image just like the shroud, just crack up and laugh, because he's an idiot. There's no big, it's like a hair on the back of your hand. The upper curved surface of the fibers of those hairs are the shroud image. If you snap them, they're pure white linen at their core. Next. So we come to scripture. <coughs> Romans 11, 25, 26 tells us that when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, all Israel is going to be saved. Depending on how you look at biblical history, that time has come in our generation. Because when Jerusalem was recaptured, from the hands of the Gentiles. And right now, the, the, the Arabs, the Muslims, are trying to recapture what? The Temple Mount. Right. Why? Because Satan said, I'm going to put my temple above the temple of God. That's why. Know the scripture. Know what it says. Jesus said, search the scriptures, because you think you have eternal life, and they testify to me. When you read these things, and by the way, Paul, in Romans here, if you go back and look at the context, is quoting Isaiah. He goes on to say, who has believed our report? Where is the who has believed our report? Right after, they'll look upon them, his marred image, his marred body more than any other man, and they'll be startled and sprinkled. See that in a minute? Behold, my servant shall be openly. He shall be exalted and extolled be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage, his face, was so marked more than any man, and his form, his body, more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which have not been told them shall they see, and that which they have not heard shall they consider. Let me tell you how this scripture burst into my life and why it has kept me in this research for as long as it has. My first book came out, let me check my watch because it's sometimes good. I'm okay? Good. <laughs> um, my first book came out on my birthday, October 1981. And, um, you know, every fighting pilot has a little bit of an ego. Don't let these guys fool you. <laughs> I, I looked on the New York Times bestseller list, and there was my book, Above St. Ziegler, my hero, <laughs> right in the top 10. And it went around the world, it went into 15 foreign languages, and it went into Braille, and people from Poland and India and all these places were contacting me saying, can we translate your book? And then the enemy lowered the boom. Oh man, they lambasted me. They said I was emotionally involved. Uh, they said because I've been raised a Catholic, I did it. I mean, just, you can't imagine the attack that came. And they actually tried to stop the book. They, they actually tried to put a lawsuit on to stop the book. So I was frustrated. I was through. I told my wife, 
I don't need the shroud. It's not part of my faith. I'm excited that I got to see it and to test it and tell the story, but I don't need it. And so we decided to get away. Actually, we drove up. We went all the way to Maine. We drove up from New York and went all the way to Maine. And um, on the way, my wife said, you know, the scripture says, whoso findeth the wife, findeth the good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and obtaineth favor from the Lord. So my wife says, uh, what is Isaiah 52? I said, well, I know what Isaiah is all pretty messy on it, but I don't particularly know what Isaiah 52 says. God wants you to read it. And I read this passage that you're seeing on the screen, and here's what immediately came to my spirit. When Paul was brought before King Festus, he says, Festus, this thing was not done in a corner. The whole world knows about it. So I said, well, wait a minute. When Jesus was crucified, there was a little petty king involved. His name was Herod. This is now Paul's day, which is future to Jesus, and the kings of Paul's day know. I said, how can that be literally fulfilled to kings to see what they had never been told? And that word consider means to study. How can that happen unless there's a picture somewhere? And at that point, I said, okay, Lord, I'll do this. <laughs> People say, well, God's not into images, okay? Explain uh, Psalm 17, 15 to me. Sweet Psalms, David again. I will behold thy faith in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I wait with thy likeness. How about Moses talked with God face to face as a man talks with a friend? There are many references in the Bible that say <coughs> God was seen in earthly form by man. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. But then there was this, 1 Corinthians. For now we see through a glass yes, darkly, yes. modern English, a dim, mirrored image. What is a shroud? A dim, mirrored image. But then we shall see face to face. And when you look and take all these scriptures in context and find out, for example, that Paul is about to talk about the resurrection and the victory over the grave, and you find out in Romans that he's talking about Isaiah's prophecy, and you put them all into context, I reach the conclusion that the shroud <coughs> is meant for our generation. And I began to say, Lord, why has the church been so laissez-faire about this thing? And then I said, it's not for the church. It's for the Jew. Next slide. Oh, there it is. Go back up. Sorry. I got ahead. If the casting away of them be reconciling the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we'll live in his sight. Do you understand the one and two day thing from Scripture? One day is as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So on the second day, he's going to revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. You know how many Christians were believing that a year 2000 would be the time of Christ's return? They got fooled, didn't they? Because Jesus said, you don't know the time or the hour, but you can know the signs of the times. Yeah. Golf 1 broke out. Pastors were saying, I'm going to get not so. Nations don't line up. Golf 2 lined up. Pastors were saying, I'm going for sure. Even the news media got in on the game. I said, not so. Nations don't line up. This year, folks, Persia rising its head. Gog and Magog coming down from the north to be involved in the Middle East. And what's taking place quietly that a lot of people don't know about is Jews are coming to their Messiah. Yes. Yes. Jesus said, what? What did his word say to us? When the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved. So I looked at this, the Zion. And in Hebrew, it means to spur, to <coughs> sprinkle, to startle. And it's tied with the blood of expiation. You know what I mean by the blood of expiation. That's when the priest would go in to the Holy of Holies, and he would take the blood of the Lamb, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And he would anoint the horns of the altar, and then he would come out and sprinkle it on the people. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, yep. There's no remission of sin. That's exactly yeah. right. 
I also found it fascinating that the blood on the forehead is over a phylactery, little leather box containing a portion of scripture. And when you see them in Israel, they have the shin, that what looks like a backward three, the shin embossed. And you know what that means? The blood literally covered the law. Yeah. Yeah. So I looked at it. Zechariah says, I'll pour it out in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They'll look on me when they pierce, and they'll mourn for him as one mourned for his only son. And I'm getting ready to close with it. Christians, we're expecting the Lord to come back. Any minute. All signs are lining up, right? But what I don't believe is in this rapture me out of here, Jesus, there's no intelligent life on the earth. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to shake up your theology, but I believe the Bible teaches we're not ordained to wrath. That's different from we're not ordained to persecution. Yep. We're not ordained to tribulation. We're not ordained to wrath. And if you doubt that, ask yourself this question. Why are Christians now being beheaded for the faith? Why are Christians in America being ridiculed and mocked and put down for our faith? You think persecution isn't coming? Wake up, church. Yeah. yeah. It's already here. Yeah, it is. But right. I don't believe we're in the wrath. But I do believe that we're expecting our Messiah. So are the Jews. Chris went to an El Al event, I think it was, right? And they were talking about, well, yeah, we're expecting the Messiah, and when he gets here, we're going to ask if this is his first or second time. <laughs> Whoa. But what are they expecting? They're expecting the same thing they expected in Jesus' day. They were zealots. They expected Jesus to come in on a white horse, knock the Romans out of power, sit on the throne of David, and rule. Yeah. They didn't get that. They got the cross. Yep. So now what are they expecting? Same thing. They're expecting Jesus to come in on a white horse, knock the Palestinians out of power, sit on the throne of David, and rule. Why would you mourn if you saw your Hebrew come on a white horse? By the way, Revelation says he's coming on a white horse with a linen garment dipped in blood. Further says that the clean white linen is the righteousness of saints. Why? Because it's dipped in his blood. So why are they going to mourn? And how are they going to look on the one they've pierced? Next three slides one at a time. Nazar, first letter, none. It means fish, sprout, seed, descendant, offspring. It also means heir to the throne. Next. Zane, second letter, Zane. It means a sword, an axe, a weapon. It is the verb to pierce. Final letter. It means to behold. Put it all together with Hebrew pictogram, and you have. The Zah means, in literal Hebrew, behold the heir to the throne pierced. Now, I may not be the sharpest tool in the drawer. But, you know that old saying, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, swim like a duck, it's a duck. If it looks like the burial cloth of Christ, if it matches the word of God like the burial cloth of Christ, if the scriptures line up with it, it just might be the burial cloth of Christ. But I told you, I didn't come to convince you of that, but guess what? I walk out the door today. You can never again say you didn't know what it cost Jesus to believe the cross of the mm. You've seen it up close and personal. Yeah. That's a lie. Yeah. It'll change you if you let it. One other thing. Remember those stripes that you saw with scourge wounds? I've been giving this lecture now since 1976. And it's only improved with time because the more we've studied, and by the way, of the 40 original scientists, the ones who are still alive, all are still studying this. Our resident agnostic, Professor D. German, electrical engineer from the Air Force Academy, in that carpool, 
proudly proclaimed everywhere he went that he was our resident agnostic and he, he kept us honest. And he was giving this lecture one day as he shared with me years later at the Shroud Conference. He said, Ken, I was giving a lecture and God said, you've seen it, you've touched it, and you walk around proudly proclaiming to be an agnostic. And he broke on the spot and gave us our oh, But people who have seen those stripes and made the connection between the truth of God's word and what their eyes beheld have been healed. With his stripes, ye were healed. It's past tense, it's done. We see it in the name of Jesus. It's been my honor to come and speak to you. I know we have another service coming. I don't want to hold you up, but God bless you and thank you for having me. Bless your pastor, Chris and Mark, my dear buddies. God bless you.